shall we start at the beginning and and who, who was Nash before Newman? <laughs> <laughs> How's that? Where did I come from? Yeah. Well, I don't know. I started doing um, I started doing solo electronic music in 1975, mm. which was um, you know. Four years before, five, five years before I met Gary. Yeah. And um, I was probably one of the first in Canada, if not the first. And um, using a drum machine when drum machines were illegal. <laughs> People don't seem to know this today, mm. all these years later, but drum machines used to be illegal, according to the Musicians Association, the American Federation of Musicians, in their charter. Anybody using artificial device to make music was not allowed on a union stage. God, I never knew that. And a few years after that, this law was tested by the Moody Blues. When they went to North America and they brought over the Mellotron, the Musicians Union of America insisted that there be four paid string players in every city to be paid for the Mellotron taking their place on stage. <laughs> really? How absurd is that? Yeah. So, so drum machines were uh, considered taboo, but I got around <laughs> it because I more or less built myself as a performance artist and uh, went around the angle of being just a musician. I'm a performance artist, and this is, this is art, so fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But also, also I would put the the drum machine through a fuzz box and an echo device and just make it sound like pure noise, uh, keeping a beat, of course. Mm. So my argument always was, well, I'm not trying to take the place of a drummer because this doesn't sound anything like a drummer. And uh, that was another angle around the uh, little problem. So there's early Nash. Yeah, yeah. But so then... Uh, right, so we got that. But um, so you were playing in the uh, Eden Club. Sorry. Oh no, where were you playing when Gary first came to see you? Well, that's a good story, actually. The whole how did I meet Gary Newman? Yeah. Um, Gary came to North America. He was going to be starting his North American tour in Montreal, in Canada, and he was going to have a different opening act in every city. He came to Toronto a week ahead of time to rehearse and prepare um, band and everything for the tour. And so he was rehearsing somewhere, and I happened to be, I was already booked to be his opening act for the Toronto show only. Mm. And I happened to be performing at a club called The Edge. Oh, The Edge, yeah. Yeah, and I was performing there for a whole week. So I think the tour was going to be starting on a Friday. Gary, um, oh no, it was the following Monday. Anyways, on um, on a Tuesday night, I think it was, Gary and his dad, who was his manager, came to the edge to see their opening act for the Toronto show. Well, they liked what they saw, and they liked it a lot because it was simple, one guy. It was electronic. It was good and noisy. So in between sets, um, Gary and his dad came up to the dressing room and asked me if I wanted to do the whole tour. And it was literally about six days later it was going to be starting. Mm. And I said, yeah, that'd be great. And um, literally on a handshake, we sealed the deal. And um, next Monday, myself and two roadies were off to Montreal, and the rest is history. We did the whole North American tour and uh, ended up in L.A. in, um, I guess it was end of February, around then. And um, so the, the tour, uh, oh, no, this was, this would have been March. The month of March was the tour, mm. 1980. Yeah, yeah. And anyways, so we, um, we partied company in L.A., and uh, we went back, myself and my guys went back to Toronto. And... Um, that was it. Uh, we did keep in touch a bit through the summer, Gary and myself. And then in September of 80, I got a phone call from Gary. Um, I remember vividly it was a Thursday. 
Gary said, Nash, I'd like you to come over and do the UK tour with me. <laughs> when does it start, Gary? It starts on Monday in Birmingham. On Monday, it's it's Thursday. How do I get this together? Well, lucky I had a contact. I had my passport, but one of my – I didn't take two roadies. I couldn't take two guys. I could only take one. So I picked my stage guy, and my lighting guy got another job with another band, so he was okay. And But my stage guy didn't have a passport. Well, I had a connection in Ottawa, and we had the passport by Sunday afternoon, special delivery. And Gary sent me the money for the plane ticket because, again, it's a short notice. Mm. And it cost um, quite a few bucks for two people plus all my equipment to get flown over. And bottom line is we missed Birmingham on Monday, but we made Manchester on Tuesday. Yeah, you did. And that was that's how all of that came about. And it was all started with a handshake in Toronto. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but, but how did you feel sort of, you know, getting on stage at Manchester with all these, I don't know, it must have been thousands. Well, I didn't think twice about it. I mean, I've played in front of large crowds, and we had done the North American tour. Another thing, I wasn't that familiar with Gary's music. Right. I mean, I'd, I'd heard Cars and Down in the Park, but I didn't know his uh, other two-way army stuff, and uh, I certainly got a quick lesson on it. I just And I did, I really did love the music, and I still do love it today. Mm. Um, not everything that Gary's done has been that memorable, but I think that period of music when he was writing those tunes, um, and that was just pretty, that was just killer stuff. Yeah. And when I got to England, um, I was just, I was just pleased to be, uh, you know, playing to these rabid crowds. I mean, obviously in North America, the audiences were good. I mean, you know, good attendance, but at the same time, everybody was just getting into Gary. Meanwhile, when I got to England, uh, his crowd was obviously well established, and enthusiastic to say the least they're also very very respectful of uh, me mm. and uh, in the opening slot so that was very nice to have well I think I think I think the main thing is that people actually um, uh, uh, still respect you and still remember you from well, from them um, j just from the Newman geeks I mean let alone the fans who yeah. have followed you along from that period well but, I had I had an epiphany when I was there um, just recently, and what happened was all, every night I constantly had people come up to me and tell me the same thing, mm -hmm. and that was here was their story. Well, I, and these were all guys. Always it was always guys, and they're all now in their mid forties. Yeah. Here was the here was the story. Yeah. When I was fourteen years old. Oh, by the way, this is a, a psychological fact about music appreciation. Your musical tastes are embedded in you from the age of 14, 15, or 16 years old. <laughs> Absolutely fact. You can I ask any friend, I, think about your own musical taste. I know, you're right. <laughs> Absolutely true. I know. So all of these guys all said the same thing to me. I was going to my very first concert to see my new idol, Gary Newman. Yeah. I was 14 years old, and I'm going to see my first concert rock concert and it's Gary Newman and I go to the concert and what's the first thing I see not Gary Newman this guy in white tails and top hat and bandages playing solo electric violin mm. and ripping my face off and I never forgot it no again all of these guys who were at these shows recently 28 years later I'm going gosh these English fans have a hell of a memory yeah but it wasn't that it was the fact that I brainwashed them when they were 14. <laughs> and it's true. Absolutely. <laughs> I think I think your comment on um, one of your blogs or something about uh, uh, people following on what you're saying, you know, about uh, people saying they went to see Newman, which was their first rock concert. Well, actually, it wasn't. It was Nash the Slash. You know? That's right. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, how great was that? But then, I mean, uh, so, um, Telly Tour, you done the Telly Tour. Uh, but then you went on to, I mean, did Gary approach you about Wembley or, or, or was that? Yeah. Sort of, and yeah, what, that, was, that was much later, you know, six months later. Yeah. And 
I had um, in the fall of 1980, after the Newman tour, the Cities tour, um, I got I got a deal with Bindisk, a subsidiary Virgin. Mm. I went in the studio in December, recorded the album. In January, um, I was doing my own shows, and uh, in London, and I got a call from Gary. How would you like to uh, play on the dance album, my new album? Mm. He was working on this album, and, and I went to the um, studio and met Roger Taylor and uh, Gary, and the three of us sat around and mucked about on the piano and came up with some ideas, and that's how we uh, put the music together for the uh, dance album. But how did that feel with Roger Taylor? Was, was, well, was, was that good I for you? Or? Well, I was. he was a very nice guy. I wasn't starstruck by anything about him. Um one thing about Queen, the phenomenon of Queen, I think, is a very British thing. Yeah. Queen are not that big in North America. Mm. And we're not, I mean, sure, they're good. They're a great band, but they weren't, you know. Well, they've never done it for me, band. but, um, uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so, the, but I've been, I've been sort of forewarned about the pretensions of Queen as people, but it turned out Roger Taylor's totally unpretentious, really, really nice guy. And um, so it was just, you know, three people in the studio kicking around ideas. But, but, but was that at that point where Gary was then talking about doing the Wembley shows? Well, I'm trying to remember the chronology, but I think Wembley came in April. You did, yeah? Well... Then we were we were doing the dance album. I think it was February, yeah, sometime like that. And and the the idea of a farewell concert, I don't think he had even formulated that yet. Hmm. But but then all right, yeah. So but we go on to Wembley then, and mm -hmm. you you were um you rehearsed that um I think it was at Shepman Studios. Yeah, it? that's right. Yeah, and um, but but. How 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 did that feel running out on stage for something like the Joy Circuit? Well, again, it was I had already established myself with the Newman crowd, opening for Gary the previous fall, and Gary asked me, he said, I, I don't want you to be the opening act. I want you to be in the band, a special guest, mm. to come out and uh, play on some tracks. So we we were, we planned it and rehearsed it. We spent a week at Shepperton rehearsing, and. Um, it was it was great fun, it was the way it was supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, to be honest, when you watch um, the the video of, I mean, have you got the video? Have you still got the video? Oh yeah, oh yeah. I must send you a DVD. Oh no, Gary's bringing it out next week, and oh, pretty soon anyway. Um, I have got a DVD version, but um, <laughs> I, I I think Gary's bringing it out next month or two, so I'm um, wait for that one. But uh, oh god, I I. I there, there's this, and it still is often talked about, where Gary is sort of like almost calling you. Do you know what I mean? On on the joy circuit. Yeah. If, if, when you watch a video, he's sort of like, and you just come blasting on. He's, oh, God. He's yeah. um, amazing. Absolutely amazing. But then, so then, let's, now, what was this about this, um, this battle on River D? Now, I've spoke to Chris Payne about this, and I spoke to Russell Bell, and I did mention it to you quickly. Um, it must have been on the telly tour. I think you lot had nothing to do one day, and you were out hiring boats. Yep. And it turned into a bit of a battle. Yep. To see who can sink which boat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. Now, what do you remember about that? Well, all I remember was that I got soaked. I don't remember who did it, but I got soaked in, and my glasses went flying off my face and sunk to the bottom of the River D. Yeah, that's Russell. <laughs> right. That's, that's what I remember. I had to go and get some new glasses quickly. <laughs> right then. Right, so now, the sheep in the Edinburgh. The sheep story. Yep. Now, I've got three or four different versions of this. Now, I want to hear you... <laughs> They're all roughly on the same line. Right. Now I need your version. Okay. <laughs> well, let's see. I seem to recall it was Glasgow. 
we had just done Glasgow mm-hmm. or Edinburgh. One of the two. I think it was Edinburgh. Okay, Edinburgh, because that's right. Because there was one. Was that the last? No, I think there was one more gig left. I think we still had to do Glasgow the next night. Or no, we had done Glasgow. So yeah, Edinburgh was the last gig. They could have been. And typical thing, last night partying. So we were all uh, back at the hotel and getting wasted, of course. Hmm. And um, I forget who it was. I was my. I know I was definitely. Uh, very excited about this concept. <laughs> I think it was one of Gary's uh, roadies. It, it might have been Steve Arch. <laughs> <laughs> no, he um, wasn't involved with that one, actually. <laughs> he wasn't, okay, no. so he was safe in his bed. All right. Yeah. But it was, must have been like one in the morning, something like that, and we decided we wanted to go get a sheep and put a sheep on the bus, the tour bus, mm. as a joke. For the next morning, when when the Newmans came down to the tour bus. <laughs> God. <laughs> oh, Jesus. I, I would think about it now. It's just retarded. Um, no, no, no. It's great. Yeah. So, I remember, I don't remember who, but I remember a bunch of us got on the bus. Maybe a half a dozen. And how the hell we convinced the, the bus driver to do this, I don't know. And, of course, he was sober. He had to be. He's the bus driver. He's got to drive the next morning. But he said, okay, so, sure, let's go for a drive in the country. Remember, this is, like I said, one in the morning. Yeah. So we go out in the English countryside, the Scottish countryside, actually, to be exact. Yeah. And not too far away, obviously, you run across sheep in a field. It doesn't take much to find them. <laughs> so we pull over the side of the road, and we're just hammered, and we won't cr- climbed over the fence into this field. Now, because none of us are thinking clearly, to say the least. Nobody's thinking that, isn't there a law against this? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there is. <laughs> I mean, for all we know, it could have been, you know, Queen Elizabeth's farm, for Christ's sake. You know, we could have been poaching from the royal family. <laughs> yeah, so, I think, I think sheep rustling still um illegal. I think it, yeah, I'm sure it is. <laughs> so... We fan out, and we all go running across this field in pitch black, I must remind you. <laughs> Not, no moonlight or anything. And we're just being stupid. And sheep are running everywhere. We're trying to catch them. Fat chance. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I trip. Now, I know this was me. Anybody else that says they found the sheep is lying. Cause I no, 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 no. It's always come, come so back I'm you. running in the dark, and I go flying over something on the ground. I get up. And there's this dead sheep. And no idea what the fuck killed it. But I'm screaming to the guys, come here, I got one, I got one. <laughs> so a bunch of guys come running over. We grab this thing. It was fairly fresh. And we haul it across the field, over the fence, and onto the bus. Well, this thing had been lying there probably a day or two. It's Dunk like you wouldn't believe, <laughs> and it, now it's in the in the in the stairwell of the bus. The driver closes the door and we drive off. Well, we didn't go more than about a hundred feet before the driver get that thing off the. So we booted it out the door <laughs> and went back to the hotel. Apparently, the bus driver spent all night <laughs> scrubbing the bus to get rid of the stink from this dead sheep. Well, well, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. To this that's... day, I have no idea what killed the sheep. <laughs> um, I I didn't kill it. It was lying there. But, anyways, that's our dead sheep story, and <laughs> and the bus still stunk the next day. Yeah, I know. I mean, I love um, Chris Payne's version, which is exactly the same as yours. But <laughs> but, but um, he sort of says like, you know, Nash trips over the sheep, <laughs> and he said this the sheep is deader than dead. You know? <laughs> And he said, we put put it on the coat, and he said, it was like, yeah, we got one, you know. And um, he said, well, as you said, you know, 100 yards down the road, it's like, oh, fuck, let's get it off. You know? <laughs> so, um, yeah, yeah, I oh, know, I tell it's a great story, isn't it? So, <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I've got four different versions. There was, there was a different version by um, the sound engineer who... Um, who actually managed to get a sheep and put it in the in the room with the guy, 
and he said it's bouncing everywhere and I'm thinking this is a different story yes <laughs> you know but uh yeah, no, that's brilliant. Well, I I don't remember anybody bringing a sheep back. No, I, I'm pretty sure this completely different story. Um, who <laughs> maybe maybe I better not put that one in the book. I don't know, but um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. But but you know, I mean, the whole experience for yourself was um, how how did you find the whole experience? Was it on tour with Gary and um. Yeah, how did you find it? Well, um, I had done a few tours before that, just small things with other bands um, in Canada and the States. And um, being with Gary and his family was very interesting because it was sort of like, it it wasn't like being on a rock and roll tour. I mean, there's his his mom and dad are on tour with him. Mm. And they were not uh, prudish or anything else like that. And they weren't... uh, they didn't tut tut, you know, with anybody doing strange rock and roll things. They they knew what it was about. Yeah. But there, it was very charming actually. It was, it was quite fun because um, Beryl would make sure that uh, everybody's stage clothes got dry cleaned, including mine. Mm. Um, one night, I can't in, in somewhere in England. I think it might have been Wembley. No, um, Hammersmith Odeon. I was standing in the wings, ready to go on stage at the beginning of the night, and Beryl looks down to me at my feet, and she says, Nash, you, you forgot to polish your boots. <laughs> I swear to God, yeah, ever yeah. since then, ever <laughs> since then, my boots are polished every night before I go on stage. Yeah, but yeah. little things like that I remember vividly. It was yeah. just very cute and very neat, you know? 